to welcome everybody. Uh, this is Engineering for Everyone. I don't even think I need this. Um, it's an exciting day today. Uh, we're all here to learn about uh, fusion, to learn about nuclear energy, and uh, we have today... F fission, not fusion. Fission, I'm sorry. Fission. Okay. fission. <laughs> Professor Ruzik uh, is not only a uh, Abel Biss Bliss Professor of Nuclear, Plasma, and Radiological Engineering, uh, but rumor has it he may actually also be a superhero um, or a supervillain. I'm not really sure, but um, I know that I've read about uh, something called Hydra uh, <laughs> that's about 70 tons um, that's being assembled uh, somewhere in our vicinity. And I can't remember if it was from a Marvel comic or if it's from a physics journal, but either they're <laughs> building something that's going to have a super magnetic field that will accelerate plasmas and get things hotter than the sun, or they're a nefarious organization that's been around for the last hundred years trying to overthrow the planet. It's one or the other. Hail Hydra! No, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so one way or another, I'm told uh, that Professor Ruzik will uh, blow things up uh, and give a good show. So without further ado, <laughs> David. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. It's always important to start with a bang. Uh, and I'm here to tell you about nuclear power. Now, there are a lot of things people think they know about nuclear power, and most of those are myths. So that the title, Nuclear Power Dispelling the Myths. But before we start right in on that, we got to talk about energy. All of you use energy. We're using energy in this room. Your houses, especially this time of year, are heated. And we need to think for a moment, where does that energy come from? U.S. energy sources, primary energy sources. Oh, I use electricity. Well, the electricity was made somehow, right? So the primary energy sources. So a little bit of a quiz, OK? I want you to just think for a moment, then, then I'll have you to remember the number. What percent of our energy comes from solar or from wind, right? Everyone talks about those. This is green. This is some awesome certified building, and it's going to have solar panels. We're building a solar farm. You drive down the road. You see the big windmills. So what do you think? Just everybody think of their number. Percentage for solar, percentage for wind. OK, OK, so we got, we got a wide range of people here. So think, keep that number in mind. All right? And now I want to show you the statistics for 2014. Uh, it's about, this is how many quads. A quad is a quadrillion BTU. That's one with 15 zeros after it. And a BTU is a strange unit we got from the British, and we're the only ones to keep using, OK? Uh, <laughs> But uh, this is almost 100, so this is almost percentage, right? And uh, how many people, instead of four-tenths of 1%, how many people thought maybe solar was 5%? More than 5%. Yeah, there we go, younger generation, all right, all right, yeah. How about wind? You thought wind, I mean wind? This has been going up, okay, 1.7. Right? These numbers used to be less than one, not that long ago. Right? How many people more than 5% for wind? Yeah, a couple, OK. You see, if I add up oil, natural gas, and coal, that's about 35. That's uh, about 45. That's 80%. 80% of the energy in the United States, and these numbers are very similar to the world numbers, are done by fossil fuels. Fossil fuels make CO2. You might say, oh, you guys are really smart engineers. You should figure out a way to, to uh, burn fossil fuels and not make CO2. Yeah, well, the whole reason fossil fuels give us energy is you're converting from a relatively unstable molecule, let's say that of octane, 
to something much more stable, carbon dioxide. And that difference is where the energy comes from. So you can't not make CO2 if you use carbon-based fuels. That's the whole point. Okay, so we got 80% here. And when I first started here, I'm a professor here for 32 years now, and I've been teaching about energy for 30 of them. And when I first started, very good to know, these top three added up to 85%, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> we're going the right direction, it just takes a few decades. Um, so let's look at some of these others. We are in a corn state. I live in the middle of cornfields. And this ethanol that we produce takes half of the corn crop in America. Half. And you might say, well, that's great. Let's just use the other half and make it 4%. <laughs> OK. Yeah, no more popcorn, no more corn muffins. But actually, that's not really it. The popcorn, the corn muffins, the corn on the cob, tiny, tiny percent. How many of you are vegetarians? I'm proud. Thank you. You're saving our planet. Keep it up. Unless the rest of you want to become vegetarians, that corn goes to feeding pigs and cows. All right? And unless you want to give up your dairy products and your meats, we, it's tough to go to uh, more than not using half, right? So this isn't going to move a whole lot. Um, wood, I've got waste in percentage to per mm. That's it. I got, I got waste because this is not people heating their home by chopping logs. I mean, there's a tiny bit in there. This is the paper products industry. You might think, hey, what do they do with the branches? and the sawdust and the bark when they make two-by-fours? They burn them. And they use that energy they make at the plants to run everything else and to run the paper mills. So that's the wood, and that has a lot of growth. Hydroelectric? Well, you know, damn it, we've dammed up every damn river we've got. Uh, they're tiny little ones. I do an experiment each year. I bring my class out, and we dam up the boneyard. OK, you can get a whole like couple hundred watts from that. Uh, not really worth it, but kind of fun. Uh, so this in the US is not going to grow. This isn't. This isn't. Wind is growing. i love to see that go up to a few more percentage. Uh, we have problems with our electric grid, but uh, there is some hope there. Uh, burning our garbage, it's been pretty steady. There's a little bit of problem. How many of you actually do things like throw batteries in your garbage can? Yeah, OK, right. And it's not just the batteries, right? It's everything else. So if you really want to burn your trash, someone's got to sort through it. And by the time you add the money into sorting through it, you're probably better off just you know, buying oil or coal or something else. All right? Um, solar? Yeah, I'd love to see this grow. I do research on solar energy. I do not want you to interpret this as this is some anti-solar talk. Right? I actually get paid to do research to make better solar cells and have uh, projects in it, and I, and I love it. I think it's amazing. You go right from the sun to electricity, no moving parts. But you also have to be realistic. This isn't going to grow by some factor of 10 in the next decade maybe in the next 20 years, but then we're still at, at a few percent, right? Geothermal, there are a few places in the country hot steam comes out of the ground. Stick a power plant on it, okay? And we've pretty much done every place that's practiced. Yes, ma'am? You're right. So I'd love that to work, okay? So in this ethanol, I actually have lumped biodiesel, and that's a maybe... Uh, 20% of that number is biodiesel. If you could turn grass clippings, just plain cellulose, leaves, into alcohol fuel cost efficiently at the same prices that you can uh, buy fossil fuels for, it would be marvelous. Our economics are far from that at the moment, especially, of course, with gasoline being $1.20 a gallon. 
So this is how we use it. And you notice we've got the fossil fuel carbon containers up here. We've got renewables that have certain limits down here and in the middle, making 8% of our energy and about 20% of our electricity is nuclear power. One out of five light bulbs are run with nuclear power in this country. There's 100 operating nuclear reactors and has been for quite some time, last 20 or maybe even 30 years. Nuclear power does not make CO2. Uh, and our supplies, while not limitless, are huge. The cost of uranium is not the impediment to making nuclear power. And you can see that obviously coal we use for electricity, natural gas, this is the largest single uh, uptick of making electricity, and of course these renewables are used for them. So you might say, well, okay, that makes sense, right? Nuclear, we could build more, we have uranium, we have the technology, we have the knowledge, so why not? What are the objections to nuclear power? And I bet you know them. What do you think? Okay, so that's one worry. Accidents, right? We're, it's going gonna, it's gonna to blow us up, right? Okay, what do you think? Uh, wastes, my God, we're going to have these wastes. There's no place to ever put them for the rest of, of, your, of your many generations, certainly yours. Okay, and there's one other, one other common objection. Thing about Simpsons, <laughs> three eyes. What do you think? That wouldn't be a good thing. Uh, they could. We could. Certain kinds of reactors. Uh, mutations. Radiation. Right? So we got radiation. Those are our objections. And um, I want to, uh, to go through them each. Okay? Because the ones that, that we just called out, I don't believe, and I hope I have an opportunity to convince you, are not the objections to nuclear power. The biggest objection, and the reason it's not more plentiful in the US, is economics. It costs an awful lot to make a nuclear power plant. So, radiation, we could end up with three eyes. Accidents, they can blow up, melt down, blow up like atomic bombs. And wastes, no place to put them, would be a burden on society forever common objections to nuclear power. So let's, uh, let's start at the top. So I brought in a Geiger counter, um, and I'll turn it on, okay? And uh, there we go, we got some clicks. And I'm holding, I should hold this by my, by my microphone so you can hear them, wherever the speaker is on this, all right? And then we need to, to find someone. This is my mother and my wife here. I, could, I guess she's close. No, she has a lot of implants in her body. Uh, so, so well, let's see. Let's see, Mom. Let's see if you're, you're particularly radioactive today. Okay. Well, then you can't hear the clicks. I don't know. Are you alive? <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, actually, she is radioactive. And what's your name? Hold out your arm. Okay. Oh, John's radioactive too. Uh, probably no implants. Yeah, I know. I know. You see, the key is, is that all of you are radioactive. And the reason you're radioactive is because you have potassium in your body. A naturally occurring isotope of potassium is potassium-40. It's not made by humans. It's not some, oh, it's left over from nuclear bombs. No, it's just naturally occurring radioactive material. And you, it has a long half-life. And if you did not have potassium in your body, you would die. Because potassium and sodium are what control water going in and out of your cells. So yet you're, you're radioactive. If you eat a bunch of bananas, you're slightly, slightly more. And we can measure it. Measuring radioactivity is easy. You can do it with a handheld Geiger counter. And it's not just your bodies. I'm assuming, because this is a fancy building, that this is real wood. I think it is. 
Okay, it's radioactive. Oh my God, they bought radioactive wood. Here of carbon-14 dating. How can you find out when this building is an archaeological site 5,000 years from now what year it was made in? Because they can radioactive date the wood probably it was made from. It's got carbon-14 in it. Okay, maybe I'll just bury myself in a stone building. Well, you know, stone has thorium, has uranium in it. Granite, the alma mater, if you do a survey meter around campus, the base of the alma mater, you can notice it. It's above background because it's got granite. And granite has bits of uranium and thorium. And finally, if all that's not enough, you say, I just want to get up, you know, someplace high in the mountains, I don't know, someplace away from all that rock, then you got cosmic rays. They're coming down at you. In fact, 15,000 gamma rays go through your body every second. Nothing to do with mankind. This is the natural background radiation. So you can't just say, is that radioactive or is that not radioactive? You have to quantify. You have to be able to make a number that says, how dangerous is that? How much damage does that do to me? There is such a unit, a millirem. There's other ones, too. And you get about a millirem a day, like a daily vitamin. I'm not saying it's daily, but I'm saying it's good for you at all. I'm just saying this is the facts. The average dose to Americans is a millirem a day. And if you fly on planes or live in Denver, you get more. Why? Who can tell me? Gas. You're higher. And what does that mean if you're higher? Yeah, less atmosphere. Less atmosphere. The atmosphere shields us from the cosmic rays. If you're flying at 33,000 feet, you've got a lot less. Denver's the mile high city. Right, you have a mile less, you get about 50 more millirems of radiation in Denver. People in Denver are not dropping like flies compared to people in Chicago. Right? People do get cancer. Cancer is a major killer, okay? But this level of radiation dose is not the cause of it. Power plants have, at nuclear power plants, have absolutely no radioactive emissions. None. Everything that's radioactive stays in the fuel pellet. Coal power plants, by the way, have radioactive emissions. You can go over to Abbott and you can put the Geiger counter up there and you can see it. I'm not saying, oh my God, ban coal for that reason. It's not very much radiation but you can measure it, you can notice it. And then you take the worst accident to ever happen in the United States, Three Mile Island, and the average dose to people was one and a half millirem, a trivial amount of radiation, same amount you get flying across the country. So radiation, they don't emit. Accidents. Chernobyl, you got it. You've got it. I'm going to cover both of them, okay? But if you think, oh, I don't want to live next to a nuclear power plant, it's spewing out radiation all the time, myth. Now, accidents. Chernobyl can't happen here. And it's going to take me a little bit to explain this, but I am going to, okay? I was a professor here when Chernobyl happened, young professor, and I remember uh, the news reporters coming to our department head at the time, Barclay Jones, and they said, sir, can Chernobyl happen here? And he launched into the next five minute explanation that I'm gonna tell you, okay? He said no, right? Then they went out to the protesters on the street with signs, right? And they asked them, and they said yes, and that's about all, right? And then I thought, oh, this is great, nightly news. Finally, it'll explain to the public why Chernobyl can't happen here. And of course, the only thing that was on the news was Professor Jones saying no and the protesters saying yes. And that's because you got to have a little science, a little engineering, a little physics in this to be able to 
understand these two points. The first is containment. Our reactors, in fact, all of the reactors in the world, except the ones in the former Soviet Union, have containment buildings around them. And secondly, and this is the more subtle one, which will take a little bit of time, our reactors are moderated and cooled by the same water. If that water leaks out or boils away, the reactor stops. Whereas the Chernobyl reactor was cooled by water, but moderated by blocks of carbon. Well, we'll get to that. Let's first start with containment. A containment building is your defense of last resort. It's a dome-shaped building that is uh, really, really thick, uh, about three feet of reinforced concrete in a dome shape with uh, about five-eighths of an inch of solid welded steel around the whole thing, too. And we put them in place before anything goes wrong. That old barn door thing, right? Close the barn door before the horses get out. Put on a containment building. The world told the Soviet Union, you need containment buildings. And I don't have a really good Russian accent, but I'll try. We don't need no stinking containment building. OK, they cost a lot of money. It's a lot of money for the containment building. So, if you're in an autocratic uh, dictatorship type society where protests or logic of people make no difference, then you don't spend the money to make the containment buildings. Their reactors they swore were safe. The IAEA, other people told them, no, this is an accident waiting to happen. And it did. And it's interesting that the test of a containment building is if a plane crashes on it, it won't break. And this was, happens long before 9-11-2001. It wasn't that someone thought someone would intentionally crash an airplane onto a containment building. It was, my gosh, what if it just so happens? Jet falls out of the sky, engine falls off, and just so happens to hit the nuclear reactor. Let's make sure the containment building's strong enough. So it is, but I have a little bit of a movie if you could hit the movie lights, that uh, shows a wonderful test. As soon as I get here. OK. So they took a Phantom F4 jet and put it on a track and got it up to 500 miles an hour and had this crash into a section of a containment building. Yeah, but watch this. Nothing happens to the wall. And this is the tip of the wing going past it. Plane vaporizes. Three feet of reinforced concrete ends up with a few scratches. All right? Got smoke coming over. Yeah. If we have a meteor hit, I think you're much more worried about the meteor <laughs> than the nuclear reactor. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, probably bigger than the plane. I mean, you're coming in at some terminal velocity through the atmosphere, right? Probably faster than that. So it might not have to be a meteor that size. But if you have a meteor big enough to do that, you have big problems, I think. All right. A and, and I'll get to a few more things, too, about the reactor. So to understand, so that's containment. OK, now to understand the much more important reason, or I think they're both important, of why Chernobyl cannot happen here or anywhere except the RMBK reactors in Russia, this is like three panels, OK? So take this panel as the before. You got a neutron, and you got uranium-235. This is the middle panel. The neutron gets absorbed. The nucleus is unstable. And this is the after panel. 
You've got two things called fission products. They don't always split the same way. This is the nuclear waste. This is the high level nuclear waste is the stuff that uranium splits into. And you get more neutrons. That's why it can be a chain reaction. Those neutrons can then go and hit more uranium and make the reaction continue. But an important thing to remember is that these neutrons come out very, very fast. They come out at mega electron volts. And the chance if one of these mega electron volt neutrons hits uranium, nothing much happens. In fact, it bounces off. You need a slow neutron to be able to make fission work. I can show you with this graph, but there's a lot of numbers, so I like showing with a, uh, a demo. So here is the energy of the neutrons. It's the mega EV neutrons. These are the neutrons that are born. Their chance of making a fission is really low. This is a log scale. So it's sort of like, and man, this is such a nice new building. I really don't want to screw it up with dart holes. Um, Maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe uh, we'll do it on, on here, all right? So, so here is my neutron, okay? I better go this way. Uh, and if it's really, really fast, I need to hit the bullseye, right? Really, really fast. My God, I even hit the target, right? <laughs> Which was the first for me. But uh, no, uh, no fission, didn't hit the bullseye. I need to slow down this neutron. I need to slow it. And to slow something that's a nuclear particle, you need to hit nuclei. It doesn't care about the electrons, doesn't care about the atom. Only cares about the nucleus. The nucleus has to be about the same mass as the neutron. So water, specifically the hydrogen in the water, is a wonderful moderator. It slows down the neutron. So as the neutron goes through the water, it slows down. It also works with blocks of graphite. Carbon's not that much bigger than a neutron, okay? The nucleus, if the neutron goes through blocks of carbon, it also slows down. To get the chain reaction, we have to slow the neutron down to about room temperature, which is what, a, a, a 20.04 EV, like here, right? And notice the reactivity goes up by a factor of 1,000. And we're here, now we can make new fission events. Think of it this way. If my neutron was really, really slow, and I'm talking a billion times, 10 to the ninth times slower, then it was born at, it's moving, it's just moving a billion times slower, okay? I'll, I'll fast forward, right? Yeah, I, can, I, can hit my, I can hit my target. Slow neutrons, they kind of just mosey on into the nucleus, make it unstable, and it splits up. A fast neutron misses or bounces off if it hits it. That's called moderation. The whole point of a nuclear power plant is to make electricity. And it makes electricity by boiling water. You might think, oh, nuclear plants must be so fancy. A whole coal plant boils water, a gas plant boils water. Yeah, that's all we do, we boil water. All right, we boil water, you make steam, the steam spins a turbine, the turbine turns a generator, and you got electricity. How I got the water hot, I can use nuclear, I can use coal, right? The rest of the power plant's the same. So, what water do we use? Well, this whole process of the water slowing down the neutron, right? The water slowing down the neutron, I'm heating up the water. That's the water I'm turning into steam. In the Russian Soviet reactors, carbon's slowing it down, but you know what? The water's still pouring over the carbon, and the water's still boiling. 
It's still making steam. Now, here's where you got to think for a minute. This is my moderator, right? It's also my coolant. Let's say I run out of water. Why? Well, some idiot closes a valve. Earthquake. Meteor hits. All right? Something. Right? I run out of water. I'm no longer cooling the reactor. What's happening to my neutrons? They're going too fast, right? Nothing is slowing them down. They miss their targets. If you lose the coolant, the reactor stops, period. Not so for Chernobyl. Not so with the Russian Soviet design RMBK reactors. They lose their coolant. Carbon moderator is still there. Reaction continues unabated. Inherent safety factor. You don't need Homer Simpson to push the button. You lose your coolant, your reactor stops. Chernobyl can't happen here. Fast neutrons are produced. Slow ones cause fission. Water or graphite could slow the neutrons down and be a moderator. Water is needed to cool the reactor so it won't overheat. If you use that same water, a meltdown like Chernobyl is physically impossible. Another very important subtlety, and it's not really that subtle. When I dig uranium out of the ground, it's 99.3% U-238. That's the garden variety isotope. This isotope does not fission with slow neutrons. It is not fissile. This isotope, the rare one, the uranium-235, this is what you want. And to make it, you have to do enrichment. Remember this whole big discussion with Iran? And they have all their uh, centrifuges to enrich uranium. Well, they say, oh, well, we want to run a nuclear reactor. Of course, the rest of the world says, hey, you know, we'll just give you reactor fuel. Oh, no, no, we want the capability. OK, fine. Reactors run on 3% uranium-235. But to make a bomb, to make an atomic bomb out of uranium, you need 90% enrichment. The deal with Iran was, if we can't inspect, how do we know you're not going to keep running your centrifuges to make enough of this stuff to make the bomb? You see, nuclear engineering students that I teach, after the course in their sophomore year, can design a nuclear weapon. You can go online and find a plan to design a nuclear weapon. Designing nuclear weapons, once you understand all the physics and the cross sections, right? Designing, it's not that hard. Look, after all, North Korea did it, OK? Um, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the hard part is getting the fissile material. And there's two things. There's plutonium and there's uranium. Uh, uranium is a common element. It's everywhere in small quantities. So you can get uranium. There's no way you can stop people from getting uranium. The key there is enriching it. It is not trivial to enrich it. It takes big plants. You notice them on satellites or other stuff, right? We knew Iran had centrifuges. So this is the deal. Reactors cannot blow up like atom bombs. That's another myth. There was a whole TV show on it. How many people remember the TV series 24? Someone, right? OK. One season, and I hated this season, OK? They stole some little box. And with that little control box, they could somehow control all the nuclear reactors in the country. And they could, if they flipped the switch, have a bunch of mushroom clouds. And the reactors would blow up like bombs. Yeah, I don't know how you enriched all the uranium all of a sudden in those. But you know, OK, it's Hollywood. So enrichment, since bombs are 90% and reactors are 3%, it's physically impossible for a reactor to blow up like an atom bomb. So then you say, well, what about Chernobyl? The explosion at Chernobyl was an ordinary one, like dynamite would cause. It wasn't an atom bomb going off, all right? And I think a really good illustration is to show you a picture. 
Uh, this is Chernobyl right after the accident. This is where the reactor was. Notice there's no containment building. Okay? This reactor, they had two reactors. This one kept operating. If this was an atom bomb going off, right, this building's gone. It's glass, right? We certainly don't have people next door running and making electricity. So remember, that explosion is like this one. Got to wake you up. Now the problem with that explosion, because there was no containment building, remember I told you the stuff that the uranium splits into, the fission products? That's the high level waste? That's supposed to be here, and now it's here, here, and in Poland, and across Europe? Yeah, that was a radiological nightmare. Not only did 30 some firefighters die fighting it from radiation sickness, but the best statistics say somewhere around 20, 25,000 people across Europe will get cancer sooner and will die sooner than they would have otherwise. Right? Yes, ma'am. 86. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Doesn't seem, seems like yesterday. All right. All right. So here, I got some more pictures of Chernobyl. Here's, here's another one after they started some of the cleanup. Uh, here is after they closed the barn door. You see, afterwards at Chernobyl, they actually built a containment building. Okay? They call it the sarcophagus, but it's the same principle. Of course, we put containment buildings around our reactors beforehand. And if there had been a containment building, we would not be talking about it. Being in the nuclear engineering department, I probably still would have known the reactor turned into, you know, a useless pile of rubble, but it's an explosion like the firecrackers, a dynamite explosion. It's hot carbon rods getting really hot and water getting really hot and turning into hydrogen, right, and oxygen, and it blowing up like dynamite would blow, a chemical explosion. It would not break a containment building. And none of that radioactive material would have gone anywhere. So now, what about Fukushima? Fukushima killed absolutely no one. 20,000 people died because of a magnitude 9 earthquake and a 40-foot wall of water from the tsunami. It was a horrible, horrible disaster for Japan, a modern country I've been to many times and I like a lot. Ships, giant ships, end up in the middle of towns. This is not some doctored photo. Look at the height of those trees. That's the water coming over them. There were all sorts of factories, all sorts of people, apartment buildings that are washed away and devastated and gone. There are other power plants, washed away, gone. And there was a nuclear power plant near there. So here is the Fukushima reactors, which were fairly old, built in the 70s. Different kind of reactor. This is a person. Okay? That's the size we're talking about here. The containment building, okay? This is the containment building right here, the three foot thick thing of concrete. And it worked. It absolutely worked. Right? Even under that earthquake, the containment buildings did not crack did not uh, let out the content of the core, which is in here. Now, I want to notice a couple things about this. And this is poor design, and I'm going to tell you about how things have dramatically improved since the 1970s when these were built. This stuff up here is spent fuel. You have to refuel a reactor once a year, and then you have to store that spent fuel. It's obviously much smarter to store it below ground, like over here, where you can keep water on it. This is four or five stories up in the air. And you can see, from an engineering point of view, why they do that. They take off the top of the containment building, they move the crane over, they unbolt the top of the reactor, they pull it out, they bring it over next door, and they set it down. If you remember, and you had it here, oh, they have to keep water on it. They had to keep water on the spent fuel. 
because even though there's no chain reaction, those fission products, the uranium pieces that are left over, they are radioactive. These are the high-level wastes, and they're giving off heat. Now, they're not going to start a nuclear bomb. They're not going to, to make you know, a, a big, giant fireball of heat. But if they get hot enough, the barriers, the cladding, you see a, um, the uranium is in something called a fuel pellet. And you arrange several pellet, pellets into a fuel pin, and you put several fuel pins in a fuel rod. And the fuel rod has a cladding, a zirconium, aluminum alloy, very high temperature, very strong. But if nothing's cooling it under the designs of the 1970s, it will eventually start reacting with the air and evolving off hydrogen. There is a safety system. Notice these tops of the reactor are called blast panels. If there was a hydrogen venting because the fuel getting too hot, you should be able, you'll have an explosion, but the blast panels will come off. And the explosion at Fukushima was exactly that. It was the blast panels coming off as designed. But this is a poor design, having your spent fuel up here, because you need to keep it covered. And the spent fuel did leak, and radioactive material was dispersed. So we go back to our radiation question. How much? Is it dangerous? What is the REM level? Can you monitor it? Japan's a modern country, and this happened in modern times. Monitoring was everywhere. And there is an area that's contaminated that you can clean up, because you can bury it, right? It's all a matter of money, uh, of cleaning that up. But the radiological levels that people got are far below that that are going to cause damage. So having the spent fuel outside the containment structure is not a good idea, and it's not a good idea to have it up in the air. Here is the reactor beforehand, right on the edge of the ocean. Okay? Here is an aerial view afterwards. Two of the buildings have their blast panels. This top layer here is, uh, are blown off. And you notice, though, they had several safety systems. The first safety system was you have diesel generators making electricity. Because as long as a pump's still running, right, I can still put water into my spent fuel. So the reactor instantly scrams. That means control rods go in. The chain reaction stops. Now the diesel generators come on to part providing pumping, okay, keep all the water flowing. And then the tsunami hits. And they had a wall, seawall, around the generators. Just not high enough. I mean, this was, a I mean, magnitude 9, probably worst uh, earthquake and tsunami of the century, right? So uh, the generators don't work very well when a giant wave of salt water pours on top of them. But there's a backup. They had batteries. They had battery banks that would last for six hours to run the pumps, with the normal thought that in six hours, you get more batteries, you run a long extension cord, <laughs> you know, you get power from somewhere else, you do something. But remember what it, how devastated the entire countryside was, right? What's different? What's different both in the U.S. and the reactors that we're building today? Fukushima was about 40 years old. All U.S. plants since Three Mile Island in 79 have hydrogen absorbers. We don't have to have the top of the building blow off with glass panels, right? We install hydrogen absorbers. Japanese said, eh, it's such a low risk. Um, and actually, whether or not the blast panels blew off, it was still open to the atmosphere. I mean, those aren't like hermetically sealed domes, right? Um, but this is the important one. We are making across the world generation three reactors. The reactors I showed you were generation two. The new things in the last 10 years are what are called passively safe. No water pumping is needed. These are walk away safety. This means that if you have whatever combination of calamities, the reactor clearly stops fissioning, right? 
But what about that waste heat, right? The stuff that caused the cladding to fail and the, and the radioactive stuff to spill out at uh, Fukushima. The passively safe reactors have a lower density of energy in the fuel. So it costs a little more. But convection, natural hot air rises, is enough to cool it. And you might say, oh my god, what if you put a giant vacuum bag over all of it? Well, yeah, right. OK, that doesn't happen. You're not going to get away from air. So just convection, just hot air rising, other air coming in, is enough to cool generation three reactors. They're being built in the US. One will be coming online soon. There's another one under construction. These are the first new nuclear plants in the US in 30 years. Uh, they're built in China. There's one in uh, Korea and in Japan. Generation three reactors are what are being built across the world because of this pa passive safety. If you have some combination of disasters, you can just walk away. You don't have to heroically try to keep water in something. You don't have to have backup electricity and backup electricity and backup to backup electricity to keep the pumps going. OK, this lady had a question for us. Yes, sir. Yep, absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's a matter of magnitude. Remember, your spit's radioactive. Okay, So is the water radioactive? Yes, I can measure it. Is it radioactive to the level that you would care at all, that you should care at all, that has any harm whatsoever? I believe that answer is no. Ma'am? Uh, it was. It's a generation two plant, though. It's very much like the Fukushima plants. Retrofitted with the lessons of Three Mile Island, okay? But it's not one of these new ones. Question in the back. All reactors in the United States are generation two. Our generation one reactors were decommissioned. They look like nuclear submarines basically hooked up to a grid, okay? Everything's generation two except these new ones being built, which will come online soon in Vogel, South Carolina. Oh, yeah. I mean, how that happened was just ridiculously stupid. But let me, I got, I got like two, couple more slides, and I noticed them, and then I'll get more questions, okay? Because I do want to finish. I know people have to leave. We are on to the third thing. We did accidents. We did radiation. Now wastes. Wastes are the fission products, and they are very radioactive. But the amount you make is tiny. If I take all of the fission products that a plant makes in one year, it fits under this chair. That's the volume. Can you say that about a coal power plant? Okay. This is the volume of nuclear waste for one year. And they're solid. You don't ever open up this. The nuclear wastes are here in this fuel pin, in that little fuel pellet. They're not green radioactive goo making turtles into ninja fighters, all right? It's solid, and if you say, what are we going to do with them? Well, right now, they are at the nuclear power plants. Well, power plant, Clinton, been operating for 40 years, or 30 years, 35 years, something, right? Where are all its wastes? At the plant, because this is how much you make. You make a chair's worth every year. Now, what do you want to do with them? We have a professor here, Professor Singer, not this singer, Andy Singer, Cliff Singer, okay? And he published a paper called Plan D, and his thought was dry cask storage. I take this, I pour a giant concrete block around it, you know, half the size of this room, well, put a bunch of them there, and you let it sit there. And you'll say, oh my God, that concrete will crumble. You're right, and when it crumbles, you do it again 100 years from now. Okay? Or maybe you use them. You are making isotopes that don't otherwise exist. 100 years from now, maybe those are going to be the most valuable thing around because we found that you use this element number 102 and you can do something with it. It's really great. So dry cast storage 
if that giant concrete block is here, I can take my Geiger counter up to the edge of it, and I can't even tell. And you might say, oh, terrorists are going to steal it to get the plutonium out, right? OK, how are you going to, is no one going to notice that you're drilling through you know, 30 feet of concrete at a nuclear power plant behind fences with surveillance cameras? Right? I, I think, um, but there are other ways to do it. You put them in casks. Now, this is stainless steel with some plastic liners. And inside, where you're going to put the fuel pellets, you put grout. Grout is cement without the gravel and the sand, right? Cement. So if someday, 1,000 years from now, a drop of water gets into it, it turns to concrete, right? And then you take these containers and you put them in solid rock casements. And that rock is 1,000 feet below ground and 1,000 feet above the water table. And you choose a mountain to do this. How about Yucca Mountain in Nevada that's in a desert? And by the way, just on the other side of Yucca Mountain is the US government's nuclear test range, where for, we don't do it anymore, but for many, many years, the government took nuclear bombs, dug a hole, put them underground, covered up the hole, and blew them up. Okay? And what happened to that waste? Well, it's in the hole, in the ground. There's no casement over, there's no grout, there's no plastic, there's no hydrological surveys of rock and everything else. Right? That's on the other side of this mountain. But you know, doing all that is a bit of overkill because the wastes are solid. Liquid waste, like you know, the water I poured in here, if I pour that on the floor and I start tromping through it, it's going to go everywhere. If I have a solid piece of rock and it's in this solid, this isn't solid, but if it, this were a solid wall, right, it's not going to end up on the quad until someone dem demolishes the building and moves it there. Solids don't move. So can you deal with the waste? Well, because there's so little of them, yes. But of course, and this is the last thing, You've got to get it there, all right? And so um, the military has been um, moving nuclear waste around uh, for a long time. Civilian nuclear waste is still all at the power plants. And so they devised a way to transport it, to transport it uh, safely, because you don't want this to fall off in your yard, right? So first, these are the containers. These are the shipping casks. And they put them on trucks, open trucks, because a car follows each truck along and tells the driver, hey, hey, the thing fell off in someone's yard. OK? <laughs> so, so that's the first safety thing. Uh, and um, the worry is, what if it falls off in the yard and it breaks, right? Or this gets in an accident. We don't want high-level nuclear waste spread about the countryside. So they, of course, like good engineers, you do computer models. You can tell these are in the 70s. Hair looks like mine. All right. Uh, and then you do a scale model. But then you have to do the real thing. Then you have to really make the, uh, the, the whole thing. And you put it on a truck, a uh, rocket-powered truck. Okay, And you take the rocket-powered truck. And you crash it into a very large bridge abutment. Here's slow motion. This is why you do not want to be in a head-on collision. OK, no driver, obviously. Now, it had so few scratches and it lost no pressure that they did it again at 80 miles an hour. All right, 80 mile an hour crash. Now, this doesn't look as good. Right? And when you finally get to it, you say, oh my god, did the whole end break off? Uh, no, that's part of the truck. OK. But you see, that still might not be enough. Because what if you have this crash, and then there's a rocket-powered locomotive that's going to hit it? <laughs> OK? So my rocket-powered locomotive now has to hit my shipping container <laughs> head on. Uh, and, uh, you know, got a few scratches, nothing is broken open, pressure is contained, no radiation leaks. Um, 
Sometimes they transport them by rail. And so you would have, of course, if the giant rocket power rail car crashes and just so happens to crash over a pool that's filled with jet fuel. <laughs> because you see, what brought down the World Trade Center is not the impact of the airplane, it was the jet fuel melting things. So we put it engulfed in an hour and a half of burning jet fuel after crashing it multiple times and see, are those bolts going to come loose? Is the container going to break? And the answer is no. There is some engineering you can really do. And I can protect some fuel rods from spilling out if I'm willing to pay the money. And that's what we come down to. In the end, you'll see it. It's in there. It's fine. Is the money, right? I hope I've come make the list some steps in convincing you that nuclear power is, uh, is, is safe and that the common objections aren't perhaps as grounded as you thought they were. The answer of why we don't build more nuclear plants, when oil was up at $140 a barrel, there were 36 applications through the NRC to build nuclear power plants in the United States. Okay? Two are getting built because now oil is under $30 a barrel. And natural gas is as well. So it's expensive. They do last a long time. You can actually do an economic analysis that says, I have this huge upfront cost. But if I really have the time frame of 40 years, it's in the end going to be cheaper. The plants today that are that old, they're making electricity at a very low price. But how many boards, how many industries have this 40-year viewpoint, right? What's the, going to look the bottom line my next quarter? It's one of the problems. And the common objections exist mostly because you haven't come to a program like this or been educated. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to take questions. I think there was someone back here. Yes, that, glad you brought that up. Uh, you know that the, the detail I showed of how much electricity is made by each source? In France, 85% of their electricity is made by nuclear power. The same length of ours, um, 30 or 40, 40. And it's interesting in France. They build nuclear power plants cheaper and faster than we do. Uh, and I, I love France. We spent quite a bit of time there. I've just hired a postdoc from France. And I think the reason they do it that well is the government runs it. I know, this is in FEMA. Oh, my God, the government does something right. Um, in the United States, the 102 power plants we have are made practically 102 unique ones. Not exactly, but pretty darn close, OK? Because um, we have a lot of independent power companies. The same workers that build one, the same design, they can go on. Not everyone. Some people quit, right? They hire some new people, but they, they have a progression. Um, Marilyn remembers friends that were building Clinton, right? They didn't want the job to ever finish, because then they're fired, right? So when you tell me they built like a wall in the wrong place or something? Wonderful, right? Not so in France. Because you finish this one, there's another one you're going to go work on, right? And it's a relatively small country, so you, you know, move around. So the US did take some hints from this. We pre approve we had competition to pre approve designs and have them be more uniform. So these new generation three reactors, at first there were only two pre approved. I went through all the safety regulations, designs. You know, and they're trying to be made more and more, not by the power company, but by uh, like GE or Westinghouse or someone like that, and then has it small enough to be modular to bring it there. So we're learning. We're learning. Other questions? Yeah, Dick. Cold fusion. OK. Well, I work on hot fusion. Okay? Um, and when the cold fusion craze came out, it was fascinating. I remember I didn't 
sleep for three days. And this was before internet, I know, little kids and college students, you can't imagine a day before internet, right? But the paper wasn't published in a journal. It was faxed, you know. It wasn't quite a mimeograph machine, but it was faxed. And oh, these guys put, put uh, palladium in heavy water, and they ran current through it, and they got net energy out. Fascinating, right? And of course, I thought, wow, if that works, the following thing should work. I should be able to do it with a plasma, take a palladium electrode, push deuterium plasma into it, and then I can have detectors that would actually detect fusion. You see, it's very possible to make a miraculous device that you put no energy in, yet energy comes out. Okay? The guys in cold fusion, they made a battery, chemical battery, and didn't do the right measurements to show it. And many people later who tried to repeat the experiment said, guys, you didn't stir the water tank when you were measuring the temperature. So I don't hold out much hope for cold fusion. Hot fusion, and I, as Andy mentioned, I've got a fusion device now in my lab. It's not quite as big as this room, but as big as a quarter of it. Uh, and we're working on it. I entered grad school with the thought of commercial fusion in 25 years. Nah, it's a tough problem. Commercial fusion by the end of the century, hopefully. Question. Sure. So the uranium-235 gets used up, and that's your fissile fuel, OK? So it is true you could take some of the waste, the transuranics, the things that are heavier than uranium. You could run them in a reactor and break them up and get some en net energy out of them. But basically, you're turning uranium-235, the thing you want, into stuff you don't want. But it's radioactive. Yeah, it, it, it will warm your tea. Okay. But it's not going to make all the steam. Yes, ma'am. Breeder reactors. Yes, breeder reactors. So let's say this all catches on and oil goes back expensive or people get serious and put a charge for CO2 on all fossil fuel. Then you'll see more nuclear reactors being built because there's no carbon involved. If you do that and you extrapolate this across the world, you start running out of uranium. You start running out of uranium-235 to 0.7 percent. There is a way to make the uranium-238 fission and make a reactor. It's a hot, it doesn't slow down the neutrons. It's a whole other lecture or two or a whole course about it. The French did this. Remember the French? set on the path of all nuclear power. And if they thought the rest of the world was going to do all nuclear power too, well, we better know how to make breeder reactors. They don't have a whole lot of land to mine things, right? So they actually built liquid metal breeder reactors, commercial size in the 80s, Phoenix and Super Phoenix. And they ran them, and they were the first of the kind, and they were expensive, right? And they turned them off. Breeder reactor technology exists. I think it could be done, um, and probably done quite well and safely. Um, at the moment, there is no economic imperative to do it. Yeah, oh, all sorts of questions. People who haven't asked. Yes, you, sir. Right, so the question is, how much U-235 is left? So, uh, so remember, the fuel ore is 0.7% and 99.3, right? And then you make it to 3% and uh, 97. And when you take it out of the reactor, this is about 1% and uh, 98.5 and then 0.5 and then .5, you know, the stuff you don't want. So you aren't all the way back. So the spent fuel is actually a great source to take and make more fuel out of, all right? And you do about, it takes about three years to get to that point, and you usually refuel a third of your reactor every year to make it continuous. Yeah? Okay, so 
uh, thorium reactors, uh, and a whole bunch of other cool concepts that my colleagues research are uh, what you might call generation four reactors, because we haven't built them yet. I mean, generation three are operating, right, ar around the world and being built five a year in China is the plan, okay? Um, a thorium, thorium is another naturally occurring element, and you can do a thorium cycle, so it's lots of fuel, uh, and it has certain advantages from safety and heat and other things, and it could be good. Right now, it hasn't reached the economic four where, okay, this is what I should, I can sell more easily, but maybe we will in 10 or 20 years. Yeah, question. IFR, integral fast reactor. So, President Clinton, I mean, if you look back in the presidency, it was great with balanced budget, whatever reason, I'm not trying to get into politics. But uh, in his, I think it was either acceptance, State of the Union speech, right? It was like, you know, waste in government. I'm gonna get rid of waste in government. And he said, you know, something like, he used the example of some, you know, uh, nuclear reactor thing, and unfortunately it was the IFR. So the IFR was a research project at Argonne National Lab that inherently recycled the nuclear waste. It never left the containment building. Never got outside of that three foot thick wall. And it would recycle it until you're left with, you still have radioactive stuff, but you have stuff that becomes the same level of radioactivity as the ore you took out of the ground. No one's gonna object to putting that back in, it's the same radioactive level, in a couple hundred years. You got rid of all the things heavier than uranium. And it was pretty neat, it's a breeder reactor, right? So, but it's an integral breeder reactor that sort of ate its own wastes. And it was phenomenal and fascinating, and they were about to build a test one, and it got canned through politics, but great idea, great idea. Um, well, they certainly needed a bigger seawall. You notice that every power plant, whether it's a coal power plant or a nuclear power plant, is gonna be by a body of water. And the reason for that, it's not the water you turn into steam. That water is, uh, you know, recirculated. But you've gotta ultimately condense it. You've gotta cool it back down to regular water after you've gotten most of its energy content out. And how do you do that? Well, you have some heat exchanger with a body of water. And then, if you don't want thermal pollution in that body of water, you have a cooling tower. Coal power plants have cooling towers too, it's not just nuclear power plants. You have a cooling tower that then cools that water off before it goes back into the lake or the ocean or river. So you'll always see power plants next to bodies of water. And in Japan, the body of water is the ocean, right? And you might say, well, weren't they close to a fault zone? All of Japan's close to, I mean, it's a volcanic peninsula next to the giant ring of, it's in the ring of fire, right? So I don't know how much they could do better. Obviously, a higher seawall, we wouldn't be here talking about it, right? So. I think it's 100% political. Because if I take that nuclear waste, I don't put it on the bottom of the concrete block, okay? But I put it in the middle of this, you know, 30, 40, 50 foot diameter block of concrete. That stuff that's in the middle of that block of concrete is not gonna leak into the aquifer, right? And we put a bunch of waterproof seals around it and everything else, and you got solid concrete. I mean, I'd say, ooh, some of the concrete's gonna dissolve. Fine, it's concrete. Your sidewalks dissolve and maybe get into the aquifer. But the nuclear waste stored in the middle don't. So I think that's, a, I mean, now, if you're gonna drill holes and bury it by the aquifer, yeah, I can see that being a concern. But, you know, this dry cask storage, you know where it is. If you ever want it or you wanna do something else with it, you can, because everyone knows you're intentionally doing it, saw into the concrete and get it, right? Um, so, and this is after you've stored it in the pool for 20 years, right, or something, so that it's not, there's no thermal load, thermal management anymore. Okay. 
Okay, yeah, your question. How much uranium is available for mining? Um, it's always a question at what cost, right? People always ask me, when is oil going to run out? Well, it's never going to run out. What's going to happen is that one last barrel of oil that exists on the planet is going to be in a museum and it's going to be priceless. And long before that happens, the price goes up, and then when the price goes up enough, you have other ways to extract and find it, right? And then you have this roller coaster of price. But the, the thing is that the same thing with uranium. Five parts per billion of seawater, there's a lot of seawater on the planet, is uranium. Uh, not a lot, right? But you have some beds that concentrate it, you could get it, and the ore. So I guess the real question is always an economic one. How much is a kilogram of uranium? It's cheaper than silver, for instance, more expensive than aluminum, okay? So it's, it's not, the cost of the uranium is the minor consideration in building a nuclear power plant. It's almost all capital cost. Whereas if you have a natural gas power plant or a coal power plant, it's almost all fuel. Question back there? Yeah. Yeah, so the mining uranium certainly has not been done well in this country. Because if you're the miner, you're, uh, and you're breathing in dust that has uranium in it, if I put it in the middle of concrete or even a fuel pellet, fine, right? I put it in my body. That's not good. Anything radioactive you inhale in your body is bad. All you smokers out there, you're doing that every day. There's little bits of uranium and thorium in tobacco. Don't do it. It can kill you, all right? Uh, and the same thing with your miners. So when you had people and you just shoved them into mines and said, dig, these days, you're any miners, you know, have self-contained breathing apparatuses, all sorts of monitors, and you, know, you can do it with high tech. You don't have to make, you don't need a whole lot, right? But it, it is true that in the, the 40s, 50s, probably even further on, especially making, mining the uranium for World War II, um, is, was not done well. Not done well. Yeah. We always talk about this in the context of oil and water. Mm -hmm. Electricity? Wouldn't that be cool? Um, I have higher hope for fusion, because after all, electricity is moving electrons, right? And a plasma is moving electrons, so you might have some hope there. The thing with uranium is you're basically making heat. Those fission products move, and therefore they warm up the thing they're in, and the rod and the pellet and all that get really hot, and you have to cool it. So I think with um, nuclear power, I mean, you might get it hot enough that you can split the water into hydrogen and oxygen, which later you can now go burn, all right? But I think it's, uh, it's pretty much a heat cycle. I mean, there are some cool things about materials that as they get hot, they make electricity, but not on the magnitudes we need. All right, uh, yeah. like your, your daughter who's going to be one of our new freshmen. I love it. Okay. Uh, uh, I'd say uh, half of our first, half of our undergraduates go on to graduate school. Okay. But then they get jobs, right? So what jobs do they ultimately end up with? Uh, we have three tracks, nuclear, plasma, and radiological. Gee, we have three names in our department. Okay. The ones in the nuclear track work at power plants or they work designing power plants, or they work building new ones, or if they have PhDs, they work on the Gen 4 reactors of the future, or the thorium cycles, or the other thing, right? Um, and there's 100 power plants across the country, and more are literally being built now, and tons are being built in other places in the world. So, you know, the opportunities and the number of students produced isn't enough. So, high salaries, good jobs, all right? Any, any engineering graduate from this college, right, will have that same experience. Uh, in the plasma area, you could, if you have a PhD, you could do fusion research. If it's a bachelor's or master's, you may work in the semiconductor industry. We make the machines that make computer chips. And in radiological, probably every person in this room, except maybe Johnny here, uh, has had an x-ray, right? And, or you've had nuclear medicine procedures, 
All of that type of stuff is made by radiological engineering. So there's a, a variety of processes. The three things relate to each other because they all have to do with radiation interacting with matter. And that's where they have the basic common core. All right, Andy, how long? Uh, one last question here? OK. Sure. So I teach a, um, a 100 level class. Are any of my students here? Yeah, 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 that's lots of, yeah, good. You're going to love it. OK, so I teach a 100 level class, uh, Introduction to Energy Sources 101. And um, first, you're all welcome. There's plenty of room in the classroom, OK? It's in the National Soybean Research Center. Who knows? I blew up the other buildings. Literally, the fire department kept coming, OK? Uh, at 3 o'clock on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Uh, and I have lectures on fuel cells uh, and coal and oil and just about everything along, along the line. Fuel cells, if you don't know, it's a way to directly take a fossil fuel like methane or certainly hydrogen and turn it into electricity. The Bloom Energy Box is a good example of it. And in the end, and I think my students ultimately realize this, it all comes down to economics. I mean, it's, it's, you know, the government can influence policy by raising taxes. Right? Or if they do a carbon tax or if you do a gasoline tax, right? And that changes the price balance and that can affect how you do things. We bought a Chevy Volt, right? It, when gasoline was, you know, $4 a gallon. Uh, and we did it in part because the federal government gave you a rebate, right? So the government affects policy by changing taxes, ultimately change the economic equation. Fuel cells will prosper when they're cheaper to build and make than other things. And then they're getting there. Okay. Great. All right. I'll stick around if you have more questions, but uh, thank you, everybody. Yeah.